right? May I continue? Okay, what have we seen so far? That's a question. <laughs> Should I point? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. True. That's very true. What else? Come on. <laughs> well, I didn't say that. I said that we rely on people that have done field work for decades. It's very important data, but the science is not always done only in the field. What else? Yes, many different factors affect the patterns we observe in nature, the spatial patterns. For example? Time. Time. Oceans. Oceans. Islands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And what is correlated with them? For example, for islands, isolation. So we could generalize this as isolation. What is correlated with latitude? Temperature? Temperature? Um, what else have I said? Somewhere we pointed out that uh, when you increase the number of species in a given area, there is a relationship with productivity of that area. Somehow, and we yep. said that it can be debated, but that is the beginning of my question. It's one hypothesis that we want to believe in that more is better. But I know the concept of keystone species means that sometimes you can have few but very productive instead of numbers. So maybe that's one of the contradictions to the thinking that if we have more species, then we have more productivity. We can be 30 people in this room, but there are only three very productive people. So you can increase as many people into this room, our productivity will not change. But the keystone people that will be in this room just add one extra person and there's more productivity. So I, I, I don't know, I'm struggling to believe that necessarily increasing species will increase productivity or even resilience of the system. Mm -hmm. yes. You? Yes, I tend to disagree with him. With Maybe what, uh, what he meant by productivity differs from what the ecological definition of productivity means. For example, if you pass species and it enrich the soil and it allows some other fauna or flora to thrive. It's part of productivity. Although you are not contributing anything physically, but you, you are enriching the soil. So I will count that as productivity. And if you, if you look like at the predatory activity of such animal, also another animal, to reduce or to tend to maintain a balance in the population, I will still count it as part of the productivity. For example, lion is going to thrive by eating other meat and keeping their population low. But if the lion is not there, 
those things may grow out of proportion and may become counterproductive to even though they are contributing meaningfully. So more is always equal to more? No, more may not always be equal to more, but every, every fauna or flora in the population is contributing something which may not be clear to everybody at every point in time. Well, you guys are in a, uh, this the discussion of what drives product, or what drives species richness, and how it's related to productivity. It's, it's a kind of a long debate, and there's, there there have been uh, several arguments or, or proposals that species richness increase productivity. That, but usually. Well, for, for the purpose of this course, we will usually invoke the argument in the other way, is that productivity increases species richness, and, not, and we are not exactly uh, interested in if, produ if, if species richness increases productivity, but how productivity affects species richness. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, hypotheses proposed that uh, species richness also drives species richness. Uh, so the more species you have, the more species that place tend to have as a function of the number of species it had before. Um, I, I personally try to find these arguments very hard to analyze from the uh, scientific perspective because it's kind of a circular reasoning. And even if you can conceptually uh, propose how uh, species richness affect the richness in a given area or an area around, uh, uh, it's very hard to get convincing empirical support for that kind of argument. So it's, uh, we are still a couple um, years, if not decades, from a convincing evidence that species richness affects species richness. Uh, of course, this is my own, my own perspective. Some people may disagree. Um, but here, uh, for the purpose of this day, we are more interested in how environmental uh, factors affect species richness directly, and not how species richness affects the environment. Okay, although I understand this is obvious, a possible uh, research question. Okay, all right. So, uh, I've been mentioning this term, spatial autocorrelation. Uh, I mentioned it several times in the morning. Uh, and it's th this term, uh, I'm going to uh, define what spatial autocorrelation means. But first, I'm going to bring here uh, what the geographers call the first law or Tobler's, Tobler's first law. And it's pretty simple. And it's also pretty intuitive. It's hard to understand why it wasn't proposed before. It's actually relatively recent. And in a very, very informal way, it says that everything is related to everything. But things that are close tend to be more related to each other than things that are far apart. How does that sound? So let's put that in an ecological context. What does that mean? That if you have species in an area, take crisis for example, 
the appraisals across kind of the Western Cape as a loose boundary. Um, the ones in, around Table Mountain are more closely related in evolutionary terms because they're close together than ones on the edges of the famous wire, although they're all protein. Yeah, it's a possible relationship, and it's a spatial relationship like we, we want for this course. It's spatial. Uh, and these floras are related. Yes. We can tell that. Um, why is that? Wh why are the close ones more related than the ones that are far? They, um an assumption now. Oh, My sure. assumption would be they undergo similar stresses, so similar climatic conditions, similar topography or um, soil conditions, and so they evolve to fit their particular spot as opposed to something that's facing different climatic conditions or different <coughs> soil types, and so they have to go through a different process. Right. That's a, a possible explanation. Anyone else has a, another one? I believe there will also be some degree of interdependence between those species that are really uh, that are near. For example, flora, flora and fauna. For example, you have herbivores more near where there are many grasses, and you may have some carnivores preying on some of those herbivores. The right, right. Um, and why is that? Why is that that? Uh, things that are close by tend to be more related. Yeah, because they, they tend to depend on themselves for survival. That's interdependence for survival will be part of the reason. Uh, we are particularly interested in the interdependence in, in space. So, uh, not exactly between species, but between locations locations, how this location is similar or dissimilar uh, to another location, given the distance between them. <coughs> Across a, a larger scale, when things in the same ecological area, area have the same characteristics, but then the closer you get geographically, the closer you get similarities in terms of their behaviors there, even the, the utilization of the same space. Right. Yeah. Right. And why is that? Due to the micro environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Micro environments affecting uh, the species in, in that particular location to utilize that space. And the further you go, it changes, it becomes other, other factors come in play. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, could this be linked to genetics? Yes. Genetics? Mm -hmm. Between the, rela the relationships in terms of the gene, the closeness of the genes? I don't know. If you expand. expand. I'm, just, I'm just thinking that um, uh, the, the organisms that, are, that have similar genes would probably tend to, more or less the same species would be in the same, spla the same place. But as soon as they start uh, the process of speciation, mm -hmm. they move a little bit apart depending on, on the new adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a good <laughs> and, and I would assume that they would also come from the same pool. <coughs> like you talked about the regional and local. Mm -hmm. So I think that they have the same kind of source. From, so they all draw from the same regional source of species, so it's bound to be more similar than if they were from a different realm. So mm -hmm. I think maybe that's the reason that closely, if they are related in space, then most likely they'll also be related in sense of their species structure. Mm -hmm. Maybe they live together because they have similar nature requirements. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are. Mm -hmm. That there is a competition for resources in that. So the environment is filtering which species can live in that particular place. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it filters sometimes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to give a try? Um, I'm not really related to this, but sort of similar. 
Um, is this sort of implying that this um, this law sort of assumes that with orders of magnitude around the event, it's it's highest at around the event, and then it decreases further away from the event? Mm, yeah. Is that what this law is saying? Is that a question or yes, a, it's a question. no? I I was the one asking question first. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to make questions. Okay, assuming, assuming you have to expand your idea. Okay, yeah. Assuming that's what I mean, that um, it incre uh, sorry, decreases in magnitude away from the event, so that would mean that it's sort of opposite towards something like um, the butterfly effect or chaos theory, where it says that um, something around the event is actually of a low magnitude of relatedness or impact and then increases further away from the event. Mm -hmm. So for example, something like um, bioaccumulation of a pollutant in a river or stream doesn't really affect animals in the immediate vicinity, but as it goes up the food chain, it has a bigger effect on top predators or apex predators. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't always apply to geography necessarily, it applies to biology and ecology? Well, cascade of events uh, are very common in, in like general ecological processes. That's true. Okay. Uh, and uh, because of the hierarchical nature of ecological processes, you may see a same event affecting different uh, hierarchical levels in a different way, or accumulating through the hier hierarchy. Um, so I, I agree with you. Uh, for this particular day, we are interested in how uh, biotas or species or abundances or diversity of anything is structured in space particularly. Uh, this law applies to uh, several other things like time, phylogeny, uh, but also space, but we will be focusing on space only today. Anyone else? So, you? <laughs> You're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> I was going to say couldn't, but I won't. The history also can generate patterns of similarity between close things versus far things. But everybody was giving ecological explanations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Africa tends to have a single fauna in terms of its megafauna, right? Tourists from all around come to see the big five, not the Kenyan big five versus the South African big five. But what megafauna exists on other continents tends to be different. Isn't that because the African fauna shares a history? Or do they grow there because of certain conditions? Sorry, that was a question. <laughs> so, yes, uh, because uh, the way we live, our, gener our own generation time, we tend to look at things and simplify what we are watching, like what we see. So we tend to look at short-term environmental effects. Most of you have raised environmental effects as the probable cause for spatial structure. And that's true. Environmental effects have that property or, or that capability. So temperature is temperature here is kind of similar to the temperature across the mountain. So it is expected that the same fauna and flora living here uh, may be somewhat related to the fauna over there. However, we always need to look into a deeper perspective uh, on time. So um, when we talk about biogeography, we tend to invoke historical, evolutionary, temporal events and how they affect uh, what we see today. So it could be the case that uh, the flora and fauna in a given place 
is similar to each other, in, in, in two places are similar to each other because of uh, the ancestor or, or, or the groups that originated that fauna in Florida were living in that particular place. So what the ecological patterns we see today have the signature of the patterns that, that, that was in the same place before. So you can never forget, you, you can never isolate the effects of uh, historical process, processes. I have one question and it might contradict this theory, but what happens with, I'm going to use Anna's the, um, ducks as a good example, where ones within a same bioregional area generally aren't closely related, they can't interbreed and they can't hybridize, but then we have Gen I'm using this as a very general example. Then you get a species like mallard duck, which has then been brought around the world, and they're closer related to ones, for example, here in Cape Town, our yellow billed duck, um, and they can hybridize and produce viable offspring, whereas the local ones can't. So that means they're further away spatially, but they're actually closer related genetically, and it doesn't quite fit this law. <laughs> Yeah, true. We can sit down and come up with hundreds of examples. <laughs> hundreds, virtually. Like, we can, because nature is so complex and it's so full of particularities and uh, stochastic events in the past, events that cannot be repeated and we cannot rewind, rewind history to know exactly what is the pollen, the like flying and like hybridizing something else. We'll, so, so we cannot do that. There will always be exceptions. And because ecology and evolutionary biology is so full of exceptions for almost every generalization we have, first, it makes it one of the most complex sciences existing. Like, you cannot get more complex than the subject we are talking about. We are talking about millions of independent species, and species is a general concept, it doesn't really exist, there's actually the individuals. And we are talking in a geographical scale that cannot be much larger like the globe, and we are organizing everything, lumping everything into a single analysis, and I bet there will be exceptions. Exceptions are good, they are challenging, they keep us awake at night, <laughs> <laughs> they keep our jobs, so there will always be room for more ecologists, you can never have enough, more evolutionary biologists. Right? <laughs> and we, we will never explain so much complexity. Um, so, so I agree. You may find things that are similar, that are in different uh, uh, locations or far away from each other. It's probably because of historical event that caused that. We may guess what the, that historical event is but we can never be all that sure. We can collect and, and, and find evidence that support a given explanation, sometimes not. Or we can look at things that are very, very close by, really close, and they are significantly different. So again, it's probably a, an exception. Anyone else? So it's kind of intuitive to think that things that are related, uh, things that are close by are usually related. Or let's change the word related to similar. Uh, so how can we measure it? How can we measure if things that are close are similar, are indeed as similar as we expect, or how similar they are? So for the next slides, I'm gonna uh, define the, 
the idea of spatial correlation, what it means, and then we're going to start measuring it. And we're going to have a number that you can give to any ecologist, ecologist, and that number comes with a very precise meaning of how similar things are given a distance. Okay? So that's our goal for the next slides. 